The first time I asked the question in the title of this video, I was talking about Half-Life. Now the video did good, but the answer to the question from the comments was quite clearly, like, yes, obviously it is. Also, why the hell are you playing it with a controller, you utter plonker? Still, <laughs> it was good bait. However, today I have a game where said question might be a bit more worthwhile to ask. A game that in many's eyes invented and codified an entire subgenre, a subgenre that's still sort of around today. One of the best known games of all time, and certainly one of the most ported. It's Prince of Persia. Now I've talked about Prince of Persia a fair bit. Weirdly enough, if you want to look behind the scenes at the game, you may want to check out my flashback video where I went into Jordan Michener's previous history with Karataka, the rotoscoping that he did for the animation, all of that. It's difficult to talk about any major cinematic platformer without giving Prince of Persia the recognition it's due, as none of them would exist without it. And yet, I've not actually ever gone into much detail about the game itself, I've only ever looked at that from a surface level. And even if cinematic platformers aren't a genre that's seen that much these days, a lot of them have held up pretty well still. So I thought that the best angle to approach this, such a revered game, is to examine how actually fun it is to play in 2018. So, let's go! Well, actually let's not. The first question is, what's the best platform to actually play the game on? Prince of Persia has a ludicrous amount of ports, both official and unofficial, and the quality of them varies wildly. Obviously there's a lot of official ports for major consoles and computers, starting with the Apple II original and moving on to the first port, which was to the Amiga in 1990. From there, well, you can find Prince of Persia in many places where you wouldn't necessarily expect it. The Amstrad CPC had an official port of the game, but the Spectrum and C64 did not. The Amstrad version isn't actually that bad, technically, I do believe it's only playable on CPC Plus models, mind you. With that in mind, it's a wonder that it didn't make it to the good old GX4000, but alas, it did not. The worldwide appeal of the game is shown by various ports to Japanese machines, the PC9801, Sharpix 68000 and Fujitsu FM Towns all received popular ports, with the FM Towns version notably featuring Redbook Audio. But as far as obscure computer ports go, these machines are practically the Beatles compared to the Sam Coupe. The SAM is a variant, some would say an unofficial upgrade, of the Spectrum from 1989 that sold all of 12,000 units. The similarity to the Spectrum was such that Specimags of the day welcomed it and even covered it, but it wasn't successful. And yet you can play Prince of Persia on it. Work was already in progress on it, the coders reached out to Broderbund just for the hell of it, and were pretty shocked when they gave it the official nod. All things considered, the port is solid, basically everything's there. Sound effects are a bit weird though. Things get even more obscure if you look at unofficial computer ports. There's the Enterprise 128, the UK made Z80 machine which attracted a following in Hungary of all places. Someone's made POP for that. The Soviet Union made Electronica BK and ATM Turbo also received unofficial ports. In 1998 someone made a demo of the game for the Hewlett Packard 48GX calculator, and as recently as this year, a man named Kieran has made a version of the game for the BBC Master. Needless to say, there's lots of ways to play the game, from modern remakes to all kinds of ports for what seems like any even remotely significant computer and console, plus handheld versions for the Game Boy, Game Gear and Game Boy Color. That port came out in 1999. So, well, what do we play? Well, let's keep it simple. I prefer to keep my Prince of Persia largely as it was originally intended. The Mega Drive and SNES versions have nice graphics, but they kind of screw around with the controls which, as will be seen, makes the game even harder to play than it already is. I'd rather play a version that's pretty close to the original while having a bit of a nice sheen on it. And so, as you might expect, I'm going with the Amiga. It, the ST and the DOS version were the original ports, and they're still the best of them, the ones that really made Prince of Persia the legend it was to become. 
This is one of those games that just works better with a single button and directions, honestly. So, now, let's get to it. In case you don't know, the Grand Vizier Jafar has kidnapped the Sultan's daughter and has given her an hour to marry him or die. You, as the prince, must travel through 12 levels, from the dungeons all the way up to the palace tower, navigating traps and battling guards every step of the way. There's no lives as such, just the timer. Any death results in you starting a level from scratch, with the hourglass continuing its endless trickle down to zero. Considering how big and tough some of these levels can be, deaths can often be quite punishing. The big thing about this and most other cinematic platformers is realistic movement. There's momentum in everything and you can hardly stop on a sixpence. You can only take a big jump if you have enough space to run first and you have to climb up to ledgers often. Basically you're playing as a very athletic man, but a man you are, so there's limitations on what you can do. You certainly can't fall that far and you certainly won't be running everywhere. A lot of times you'll have to slowly edge forward, either to get on the edge of a platform in order to line up a jump, or to slowly get past a spike trap that'll kill you if you run at it. This isn't a game about reflexes, it's much more meticulous and planned out. How well do these controls work today then? Well I have to admit that in this department, I do struggle a lot with Prince of Persia. There's a certain jerkiness to it that makes it tough to control right. There's times when you miss jumps even though you seemingly press the button well before you reach the edge, and that usually means death. It's very finickety. Weirdly I find this to be even more true of the later versions on consoles, which are usually worse because the controls are pretty awkwardly mapped, especially in the Mega Drive game which seemingly just assigns various actions at random. At least a single button makes it simple. But there is another thing that I've never liked about the game, the sword fighting. I just find it quite annoying. So often you do something that's clearly a hit and yet it doesn't register, or you pressed to parry half an hour ago but it doesn't happen and you get hit anyway, and the fights are basically always the same. One thing that's notable about a lot of other cinematic platformers, how many of them featured close range or hand to hand combat? Not many. To be honest, I think Prince of Persia kinda shows why a lot of the other cinematic games opted for ranged weapons, with all the animation around and the slow pace, close fighting just kinda feels very awkward. As a fan of the genre, naturally you can't help compare this game to the ones that came after, and even though they all follow the template which P.O.P created, I tend to find them a bit more forgiving in the control department. Maybe because the animation's a bit more fluid? Maybe because for me P.O.P does one that little bit jerky and fast? Those seem to be the likeliest explanations. Of course these games have plenty more in common with the original than just controls, which leads me into the whole design of Prince of Persia itself. Cinematic platformers are quite often very trial and error, you have to find the precise way for a situation, and usually the way to that solution is scattered with the corpses of failed attempts. You get used to sneaking quietly into the next unknown screen because usually if you run in, you won't have time to react to the jump or the trap, and then you'll be dead. Some games are a bit more forgiving in this department. Another World is extremely difficult, but it also has frequent checkpoints and infinite continues, plus it's a pretty short game to begin with. Flashback is quite punishing, a death can mean going back to the start of a level and the levels are long. However, there are also a fair few save points which you can use, which allow you to restart mid-level if things go wrong. Prince of Persia? Easily the most punishing of them all. No saves, and all deaths take you back to the start. Enough deaths will simply make the game unwinnable. You only have an hour after all. For me this can make Prince of Persia feel like a bit of a slog. Essentially it's all about developing a memory for every stage and knowing how to get through them. And even then you can still fall foul of a sword fight or the controls if you aren't careful. Of course these things do get better with practice for most people, for me they're things I've never been able to grasp but perhaps that's just me being rubbish. There isn't a lot of variation in the game either, which is perhaps to be expected, it was after all the first. The fights, jumps and puzzles can get a bit samey pretty quickly, and usually when I play this game I do have to say, it's not long before I fancy playing something similar that changes things up a bit more. 
Now all this makes me sound as though I really don't like Prince of Persia, but there are things that still entice me. You might expect me to say that the graphics aren't much to shout about. Prince of Persia is all bricks and mortar, whereas, say, Flashback is filled with alien worlds. But I've always appreciated how clean this game looks. It's not eye-catching, but it's utterly serviceable and consistent. And the animation is still pretty gorgeous, even if the game's nearly 30 years old. I find that looks-wise, the original still has a lot to shout about, even when compared to later efforts that tried to add to the graphics, but in the end added a bunch of fins that the game just didn't really need. The cinematic presentation and sound still holds up nicely too, an evolution of the already good stuff that was in Jordan Mechner's previous game, Karatika. I still think that, aesthetically, Prince of Persia is a very nice game. Now with all these main bases covered, there are still some other angles to take this from. What about modern improvements? Some old games may be tough, but some might find them highly improved by, for example, using save states or rewinds in an emulator. Kid Chameleon is a good example, a game that's way too freaking long and has no passwords or anything. It's better if you just use save states to come back to it when you want another blast. You can do this with Prince of Persia, of course, but is that a satisfying way to play? I mean, it's not that long a game, not one that's really meant for multiple sittings. If you use save states, you turn an extremely difficult game to one that pretty much has zero challenge. You'll beat it in the end, and you won't need to worry at all about the timer. So in this instance, I'm not sure if doing such things makes the game any better, really. Kind of the opposite. Save states and the like are worth it if the game still retains the satisfaction of beating it, and as long as you know, you can exercise some discipline. And while I've never beaten this game because I'm admittedly pants at it, I can't say that cheesing it makes it any better. But then, well, maybe it actually does. Because there's one thing about Prince of Persia that's still stronger than ever. It's narrative drive. I do the game a pretty intense disservice by reducing it merely to a bunch of jumps and sword fights, and there's so much more to it than that. Even now, playing Prince of Persia, it's still easy to see why the game was such a revelation, and why it was treated like such a groundbreaking game. Jordan Mechner managed to spin a complex little narrative, full of twists and turns, with almost zero words. Karatika was the template here, of course, but P.O.P. was the full one. It's not half surprising when the game suddenly gets supernatural, the fight with the skeleton, the reveal of your doppelganger who then leaves you no option but to plunge down a hole into the next level, the potion that lets you glide down. There's all these different story beats at a time when most non-RPG games were still jump on monster. This is one thing about P.O.P. that reverberates through the ages, not just a monster games immediately influenced by it, but ones that came decades later and awkward control still can't diminish that pull. It's like a bloody good romp of a silent movie, which considering the sort of films that influenced it is actually thoroughly appropriate. So is this game still worth playing in the year of our Lord 2018, current year? I ask this question not to diminish the game's achievements of course, Prince of Persia is a stone cold classic one of the most influential games ever, and a game that will forever live on, way after this channel's dead and gone, that's for sure. For me, the game was improved upon by others. It still took a while to perfect the formula that this game created. I mean, if I'm honest, I find it a struggle to play another world nowadays as well. But once Flashback, Blackthorn and the like came out, even back then it became a bit hard to go all the way back to Prince of Persia. Some would also point to the game's sequel, The Shadow and the Flame, as another title that improved further upon the original's template. Prince of Persia did get left a little behind in the end, and I think if you want to find the definitive example of a cinematic platform and see just what the genre is about, maybe you'd be better off playing either the sequel or flashback or something like that. And yet, obviously, people have always found worth in it, hence the fantastic revival of the franchise in the early 2000s, or that film, or the fact that to this day, people are still coding versions of the game for just about every platform out there. Even if the actual play may not be the best nowadays, there's still many things that make this game relevant that just can't be ignored. Bye for now. Many thanks for watching. If you like the video then do please like, subscribe and all of that. Also special thanks to these members of the community who contribute through Patreon. 
Adam Schaefer, Alex Stoko, Alexander Jazeri, Andrew Dalton, Andy Capt, Daniel Briggs, Daniel David Taylor, David Rose, Dustin Cooper, Gary Pinkett, George Newton, Grafham Blackpool, Ian Roberts, James Id, James Loveridge, Jason Durso, Jason Goy, Jason Stevens, Jace Alexander, Josh Jensen, Lee Norris, Mark Greaves, Martin Pataki, Mike's Games Room, Morton Scunnin, Nanette McCrone, Nicholas Tristan, Olaf Albin, Peter Jack, Peter Sidorn, Phil Taprog, Piotr Margell, Pocky Southmaid, Rachel Maxwell, Romeo, Ryan Burford, Sammy Lee, Samuel Victor, Scott Coulter, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Stephen Warner, Yucca Operator, and Zach Roach.